as oil prices soar to record levels, Nigeria ordinarily is expected to be raking in billions of dollars and realizing accretion in external reserves, as was the case in the past, especially during the Gulf War and some other international emergencies. Unfortunately, this is not the case, as the country is still grappling with challenges in the oil and gas sector. However, there are indications that all theft may be escalating as a result of sharp prices in the price of international or sharp rise in the price of international market. Consequently, indigenous oil producers have called on the federal government to uh, urgently tackle this menace and of oil theft in the Niger Delta region, which is impacting negatively on the operations. These factors have combined uh, to ensure that the country does not benefit from the current soaring crude oil prices buoyed by the Russian-Ukraine war. To understand this, I'm being joined uh, this Monday afternoon. He's an oil and gas expert. He's an energy analyst and partner at Zero Advisory and Consulting, uh, Mr. Joseph Nwakwe. He's also the former chairman of SPE Nigeria, the Society of Petroleum Engineers. Thank you so much for your time, Mr. Nwakwe. It's good to see you. Good afternoon, and thank you, Tudu. Ah, yes, let me start this way. High oil prices. We've talked about this different perspective. You are a petroleum engineer. Tell us, what does this mean for us? A blessing or a cost at this time? Well, um, it should have been a blessing. Uh, it was meant to be a blessing, but I think we, we basically mismanaged um, our opportunities, if, if I can say that. Um, so... Uh, the way to look at it is um, the oil price has, has shown a cyclical behavior in the last 100 years. If you look at it, it's always up and down. Uh, so people invest when prices are low because invariably cost of developments are low when prices are low and, and wait for those swings. Uh, whenever it happens, they benefit. Uh, sadly, that's not the case. Uh, what's happening to us now is that um, we are we were not able to take advantage of the higher year prices for two reasons. One, we don't have the volumes because you need the volumes, which would have been the result of investment when prices are moderate, uh, you don't have the volumes. Secondly, even where you have the little volume that you have, we are eating it up through the subsidy scheme. So whatever benefit would have accrued from the limited production volumes that we have, uh, we are basically burning it in the exhaust pipe of so that's the problem. Hmm. So that issue of subsidy comes in again. But let's leave that out of it for some time and uh, look at what we even face internally as a country, uh, which is very worrisome, all theft. In particular, crude oil theft. We've had a lot of figures coming in from the likes of NATI, NBS, a lot of figures uh, I've seen even researching and preparing to talk to you today. And uh, I'll go through some of those figures moving on. But in your perspective, what do you think is responsible for this high level of all theft, crude oil theft in Nigeria? And we're still grappling to meet up with our OPEC quota. Okay, uh, thank you, Tolu. Uh, well, I can say it in one word. Um, so it's it's really um, a receding uh, capacity of the state to to police uh, the environment. You remember, government exists for a reason. Um, so when the the coercive power of the state uh, is weakened for any reason. Uh, it becomes difficult. So, and there, there will always be criminals. There is no claim where there are no criminals. of this situation. Now, I will, I will speak a little bit to what's going on. We, we, are, we are talking today about crude theft. Uh, there are essentially three levels of problems. There, there is the, uh, what we call the point of origin uh, theft of crude, which means that 
the crude that was produced at the warehead did not make it to the terminal, didn't get into the tanks. And then, of course, there's the, there's the uh, point of export issues, um, which means that it made it into the tank, uh, but it wasn't fiscalized. It's not paid for. And then, of course, there's the import uh, issue. So across this three broad spectrum, we have problems. We have problem with the point of origin, uh, making sure that the molecules that were produced at the warehead makes, get, goes all the way to the terminal and ends up in the tank. We have problem with the terminals themselves, making sure that what is loaded on the vessels are actually accurately accounted for. We do have problem with the import, making sure that what we claim we imported as products uh, ends up at the pump. So that those are the so I'm saying that no matter where you look at, uh, there are challenges with accounting and ensuring that uh, what we say we are doing is what indeed gets done. And and I, I to put that to the capacity of the states to 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 do simple things. Hmm. Interesting. Nati says forty two billion dollars was lost to crude oil theft in. Uh, uh, as well as other domestic and refined products. That's between 2009 and 2018. Now, this looks like a threat to revenue generation for us. Uh, how does this come to you? Certainly it is. Um, I mean, so, so there are, again, I will break it down this way. There are three people involved in this whole thing, right? There's the government. When you take any barrel from the ground, the government expects to get royalties on that volume. If that volume does not make it into the tank, it doesn't get accounted for, so the government loses revenue. There will be no royalties paid on that volume. So that's one. Um, so the government equally is an investor in this sector. Remember the JV government owns aggregate 55%. So it's not just losing the, the revenue, royalty revenue, it's equally losing its equity. It's an investor, it needs to get equity in return. So when that volume doesn't make it to the tank, he loses, the government doesn't get any money for that. So, so there is, the government loses a whole lot. Uh, the, the producer, the operator, whoever that is, equally loses the fruit of his labor, if you will. Remember that for every project that's done, the operator goes and says, I'm going to produce X number of barrels, I will sell it at X price, and that will form the basis for the borrowing. You borrow money to invest, and you tell your, the banks that I'm going to pay you back at so and so frequency, and then suddenly somebody takes away that crude. So the producer is unable to service the obligations they have on, on, from, from the banks. Uh, you think that producer will continue to invest? No. That producer is going to go out of business shortly. So that's part of the problem. The other issue is the host community. And this is another uh, issue. The host communities cry every day. But the bottom line is when people go and tap into those lines and either do the domain artisanal refining, which is basically cooking, they are spoiling and, and, and devastating the environment. And it affects the host communities uh, very, very negatively. So, so all the parties involved here is a net negative situation for all the parties. I think we need to address this issue because it poses not just revenue challenges, it has environmental impact, it has impact on attracting and retaining investment. If we don't address them, uh, we might as well kiss the PIB uh, or PI, PIA a, a goodbye. Hmm. Uh, now that we have a regulator, we saw what happened sometime last week uh, with the joint tax force, with the minister and the GMD uh, present, and uh, all of the uh, talking about uh, military operatives uh, in charge of monitoring uh, this, the pipelines and all of that. We're all in present. Uh, we're all present at that movement. Now, let me ask this way. What more should the regulator and all of the government agencies involved in this, what more can they do to help reduce this? Because uh, a lot of people are involved in this. We've seen a lot of people being called off, security forces, militia organizations, local people, people that live in the environment, because even employees of some multinational companies have been fingered in this. Okay. Um, it's okay, I mean, to send the, the prince 
equal parties to the to the locals. I mean, that's not a problem. The challenge I have is that that doesn't address the issue. I mean, they will get on the chopper and leave shortly, and uh, the problem uh, will continue. I think we need to ask us, what exactly are we dealing with? Uh, we are dealing with something that has been on for a long time. It's, it, don't, it didn't just start today. Uh, we need to make that very clear. So uh, it's very difficult. The law and order approach is important, but it's not sufficient. We need to engage uh, with, with the local parties. There are entities in those localities. It's, it, you know, when they still, okay, look at the volumes. Uh, our estimate is that we're looking at anywhere between 200 to 300,000 barrel of crude stolen daily. Um, you couldn't just, that just is not going to the artisanal refiners. I think there's an organized theft going on. So they use badges, they use all sorts of, those can be trapped. So the point I'm making is that, yes, going out there is good, it's ready to address the problem. We need technology, we need we need to engage the local communities. That's, so a multi-pronged approach is, is what is necessary uh, to, to start to address it. I mean, the Navy needs to police, because when the bodies go out there, they have to transload this crude into bigger vessels, right? All of that activity is happening within an area. Um, probably that's why I'm not impressed with the, because these are areas that we are supposed to be policed before now, right? So we've always had those security people. So I, I do not know if there is a solution to that problem. Um, so my sense is a lot more needs to be done. Um, and I think that, you know, sheer boot on the ground will not get it. Uh, the pipeline network is such, a, there's all sorts of swarm uh, producing locations and all that. So it's going to be difficult to just police uh, the, the area. And it's a large, fairly large area of operation. So I Wow. Mr. Joseph Wank with the technology and challenge there. We we'll, we'll try to see if we can reconnect and uh, get him back to give his views on this very important uh, discourse. All thefts and what it means. Okay, Mr. Joseph. Yes, I'm here. All right, great stuff. Uh, let's uh, also uh, talk around these illegal refineries that we see. Uh, and for example, the likes of River State and all of that. What can be done? Uh, I would ask, just like the gold miners, we talk about bringing them into the fold. Can anything be done? to encourage or are we looking at the modular refineries which is which what can we do because the argument would also be that they've been doing this for years yes you can't stay on illegality if it's wrong it's wrong but what can be done one way or the other uh to make maybe to bring them in bring them on board give them proper trainings and they can do better than what they're doing at the moment instead of just messing the whole environment up with what we see everywhere and uh, you know, and particularly in the um, southwestern, uh, southeastern side of of this one, and south south area of this country. Okay, um, and I, I, you know, I hear this all the time, but let's understand it this way: <laughs> the artisanal refiners are basically using, you know, technology that is outdated and so essentially there's no business model i can see and this is this is based on my understanding of what they do they, it's a cooking pot technology right um the useful products not see a business model that will allow you to make a profit if you bought the crude and this is the problem so if we say that we want to you know, bring them into the mainstream, great. Which is what the modular refinery scheme was supposed to achieve. It was supposed to bring them, uh, regularize some of that and, you know, license the activity. But the truth is, currently, if, they continue, if, if we use the technology they apply today, which is just basically cooking pot, there's no business. If they bought the crude, they won't be able to refine it at a profit. So that's the problem. So. My take is that 
that is an illegal activity that no one, and I, and I mean it, no one should be recommending for the country. Those who have capacity, who have what it takes to start a modular refinery, should go get licensed to produce, to, to build one. The process is clear, it exists, and people are doing it already. Uh, but telling me that we, yes, somehow we will be able to uh, transform uh, an industry that only exists because they steal the crude into some, some regular business, it is tough. If they have the technology that does not waste the crude, then yes, maybe we can have a discussion around that. But what I, I understand today is that it's a cooking, that cooking for technology is, is so wasteful. You're going to lose 40 to 60% of the valuable products in that cruise stream. And so, it, how, how do you make money out of that? All right, Mr. Joe, uh, Network is giving us some issues with audio, but before I let you go, if we can do this in two minutes, what kind of support do we expect or demand from countries uh, whom other citizens collude with, uh, with Nigerians to even perpetrate this uh, petroleum theft? Yes, and, and you know, it, that's an important point you raised. Um, there's a whole lot that can be done at the, at the international level. Uh, crude theft is not a Nigerian uh, problem. It's a global problem. Uh, so a whole lot of other countries do have uh, challenges with this. So I think that some international coalition uh, will be necessary to, to police uh, the, the, the shipping industry, because ultimately when crude is stolen, it has to be shipped to somewhere. And, and the refining industry to, to ensure, just like you have the blood diamond type of uh, uh, thing, uh, some, something in that mode where crude sources can be tagged and we know uh, clean crude as opposed to stolen crude, that will help. Some, some international collaboration will be necessary. I must thank you so much for your time. I've been speaking to energy analyst and partner at Zara Advisory and consulting Mr. Joseph Onwakwe, who is also an ex-chairman of SP Nigeria, Society of Petroleum Engineers, Nigerian Council. Thank you so much and do enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Tolu. Have a beautiful day.